Welcome back to our next session for day two of the 2021 Cancer Research Institute Virtual Immunotherapy Patient Summit. It's time to talk about lung cancer, the second most diagnosed cancer worldwide with more than 2.2 million new cases each year. Joining us to talk about advances in immunotherapy for lung cancer is medical oncologist, Dr. Patrick Ford from Johns Hopkins Medicine. Also with us is Oswald Peterson, a non-small cell lung cancer survivor treated with immunotherapy, who will share your questions with Dr. Ford. Be sure to put them in the Q&A box. Thank you, Dr. Ford and Oswald for sharing your expertise and insights with us today. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today and, and thank you to CRI for organizing uh, this amazing event. Um, as mentioned, I'm a medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, USA. and uh, Today, I'm going to talk a little bit, a few slides about some of the developments in immunotherapy for lung cancer, and then hopefully we'll be able to address some questions and have some conversation. Um, so I thought, first of all, I'd talk about some of the history in terms of lung cancer. Um, going back now, sorry, I'm just going to... My internet clicker app is gone, but we'll get it up. Good. Um, Going back uh, back to the early 80s, chemotherapy up until the, the early 2010s was a cornerstone of treatment. Essentially, any new patient I saw or any medical oncologist saw, we had one option, really, chemotherapy. We did have some developments between 2000 and 2010 in, in terms of targeted therapies for a minority of patients, but really, we did not have other options. These were all very similar combinations and a very modest benefit for most patients. Thankfully, over the last seven or eight years, uh, with work from patients, from investigators, and from support organizations such as cancer at the Cancer Research Institute, we've seen great new developments, um, particularly in terms of the use of PD-1 therapies. And these are antibodies uh, which block co-inhibitory molecules around the tumor cells, which block our own immune system from recognizing the tumor and eliminating it. Back in 2014, 2015, we saw this, uh, uh, the first evidence of these agents being approved, for example, for melanoma. And then in 2015, we saw the first approvals in lung cancer. And these were for patients who had received chemotherapy first, and their tumor either had not responded or had, had progressed after treatment. And in these studies, it was shown that drugs such as pembrolizumab or Keytruda and nivolumab or Optiva were effective for, for such patients, particularly for those patients whose tumor cells expressed high levels of this protein PD-L1. Sorry, my clicker up is gone again. If someone could, hopefully that's worse. More recently, in 2016, um, there was a large phase three trial which looked at moving these uh, medicines forward for patients with newly diagnosed lung cancer. And this combined chemotherapy, which was standard, with an anti-PD-1 medicine, pembrolizumab. And this showed that there was an approximate two-fold increase in survival for patients when they had pembrolizumab added up front to chemotherapy rather than reserving it as a single agent later. Um, and since that time, really PD-1 inhibitors or PD PD-L1 inhibitors, which is the ligand for PD-1, have become a cornerstone of therapy for most patients with advanced or metastatic lung cancer. In 2018, uh, we saw the first signals that these medicines could work for patients with earlier stage disease, particularly for those patients with stage 3 lung cancer, which was treated with definitive chemo radiation. We had not seen any advances for this disease stage of disease for about 20 years, and then we saw Dravimab a significantly increased survival for these patients as well, which is an anti pdl one antibody. Um, and it's not just in non-small cell lung cancer. We have seen this at uh, the efficacy of combination immune checkpoint blockade, and um, that's a combination of nivolumab with ipilimumab, uh, which is another checkpoint blocker for patients both with non-small cell lung cancer, but also for patients with mesothelioma, another serious cancer which affects the lining of the lung. We've also seen approvals in small cell lung cancer with the addition of atezolizumab to chemotherapy 
or dervalumab chemotherapy improving survival for patients with small cell lung cancer. In the last couple of years, we've seen these medicines advance into the very earlier stages of lung cancer. And these are for patients who have surgery for lung cancer with the intention of cure. Previously, we really did have an option of giving a perioperative chemotherapy. However, the benefit was relatively modest at about 5% in long-term survival. And this year, we've seen phase three trials, um, both giving immunotherapy prior to surgery and also for, for patients after they've had their tumor removed. And these have shown a lot of promise and have been probably some of the major developments in lung cancer this past year. There are also lots of new types of immunotherapy being developed, including combinations of the PD-1 inhibitors with other immune checkpoint blockers, and also with targeted drugs, targeted at specific um, mutations in the tumor, or what we call anti-body drug con conjugates, which essentially are complexes of antibodies plus chemotherapy. And many um, investigators are looking at combining those with the traditional PD-1 inhibitors. So I think um, we're going to really see in the next few years, um, immunotherapy has become a foundation of treatment for non-small cell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer and mesothelioma. We're seeing many hundreds and even thousands of clinical trials ongoing looking at novel therapies for patients focused on immunotherapy, including things such as um, cellular therapies with CAR-T and other um, uh, tumor infiltrate lymphocyte therapies. These are some entirely new ways which we may be able to build on the success we've seen with PD-1 inhibitors. So I think I'll leave it there. And if we have, uh, we have about 20 minutes for discussion and conversation about this topic, um, and I'm happy to try and address any questions anyone may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Ford, for that very informative, for that very informative session. I would like to first start by saying my name is Oswald Peterson. I am the Immuno Advocate for Cancer Research Institute, and we thank you for being here today, as well as being here, Dr. Ford, we thank you as well. I'd also like to let you know, if you would like to submit a question, please feel free to leave your question in the question and answer chat to the right of your screen. So we're gonna dive right into the questions right now. And Dr. Ford, our first question is, does immunotherapy only work for specific lung cancer types or for all? Yeah, so I think as well, we've seen um, the, and that immunotherapy has the potential to work for all patients with immunotherapy uh, with lung cancer. However, the likelihood of the percent likelihood it works probably differs by certain characteristics of the tumor in particular. Um, so that protein marker PDL1, which I mentioned earlier, um, high levels of PDL1 expression on the tumor cells does predict a higher likelihood of the tumor responding to, to PD-1 blockers, uh, such as pembrolizumab. However, on the other hand, your tumor may not have PDL1 expression, and it could still respond. However, the likelihood of it responding is lower. Um, there are other certain characteristics, for example, certain patients with non-small cell lung cancer, their tumors have what we call driver oncogenes, or single mutations in the tumor driving it to grow. And here I'm thinking about things uh, like ALK or ALK. Those tumors are more likely to respond to targeted therapies rather than our current immunotherapies. Um, so there's a lot goes into, uh, so when we see a patient with newly diagnosed lung cancer, um, there's a lot of different things we look at, but some of the main ones would be the presence of the pd one protein on the surface of the cells and the presence of or absence of some of those mutations, which are more or less likely to, to predict response to, uh, to immunotherapy. So can you explain to us exactly what is a PDL1 score? Yeah, so uh, so the PDL1 score is a relatively simple test. Um, so many labs across the country and across the world are capable of performing it. It's what we call an immunohistochemical assay or an IHC assay. And essentially what happens is when you have a biopsy taken of your tumor, the pathologist in the lab takes a slice of that tumor and puts it on a slide and um, it's fixed and you stain with a marker called PDL1. And uh, it's essentially a stain put on, this, on the surface of this slice of the tumor. 
And depending on how many of the tumor cells take up that stain when it's part of the surface of the tumor, that gives you a score from zero. So if none of the tumor cells take up that marker to 100, where, where every tumor cell is expressing the pd one marker. And it's kind of a continuous variable. So, so within that score of zero to 100, at the higher the score, the more likely at the tumor to respond to therapy. Um, there are some nuances, and that's mainly around the question of, so if your tumor has a driver mutation like the ALK mutation or that ALK alteration, I said, sometimes you can have high pdl one and still not respond to, to immunotherapy. But in general, it is a pretty good predictor of response. If your tumor has, has say, 50% or above, that can help guide us in terms of uh, recommending immunotherapy versus chemotherapy. Excellent. So our next question then asks, what if a patient or person does not have a predictive biomarker like PDL1? Are there any immunotherapies that can still be used? But first, can you please explain what is a predictive biomarker? So, uh, so there's two kind of different biomarkers, and it's so one is something that's prognostic. So, for every patient with a particular cancer, if they have a particular marker on their tumor, it'll so it'll give an idea of how their tumor will do irrespective of therapy. A predictive biomarker is one that if you find it in the tumor, it tells you this is the is the treatment I should use, um, and. So one important thing to keep in mind about PDL1 is that while it's a relatively good predictive biomarker for P1 blockers for immunotherapy, it's not a perfect one. And there are a significant number of patients with PDL1 negative lung cancers who still respond to immunotherapy. Um, and what we found is that for those patients whose tumors are PDL1 negative, usually a combination of chemotherapy with immunotherapy is preferable. Um, and that actually has quite a lot of efficacy and improves survival by anything from 30 to 50% giving chemotherapy to patients with PDL1 cancers versus chemo alone. Um, so, it's, so that's important to keep in mind when we, so if you're a patient and you hear my tumor is PDL1 negative, you might think immunotherapy has no role. That's not true. Um, it's, he has a lot of Thank you very much. Our next question asks, what are the new promising clinical trials for lung cancer? Would you be able to explain to us or tell us any new trials that you know of? Sorry, Oswald, I think I might have, I might be missing, uh, can you hear me? That is, that, is, that is not a problem. The question was, what are the promising clinic, clinical trials for lung cancer? Would you be able to tell us, the audience, what new clinical trials are coming up, specifically for lung cancer? Yeah. So I think there's a few areas that are very interesting at the moment. Um, what we're seeing in, in patients with newly diagnosed lung cancer is that we're starting to see studies of PD-1 blockers, which are the approved drugs, plus other checkpoint inhibitors. And one of those is a checkpoint called TIGIT, T-I-G-I-T. Um, so that's, it's a very similar concept to PD-1. It's just a different co-inhibitory checkpoint. And, and there are several trials looking at combining, for example, pembrolizumab or atezolizumab, which is another approved um, PD-1 pathway blo blocker with TIGIT blockers. Um, and they're available kind of across the US and really across the world at various um, settings. What a lot of people are also trying to look at is, can you combine this new class of medicines called ADCs or antibody drug conjugates? Can they be combined with the PD-1 blockers? And they're in clinical trials as well. And some of those medicines, um, these ADCs, have shown a lot of promise in other cancers. For example, in breast cancer back in September, we saw a lot of information on this uh, a medicine called in HER2 a HER2 blocker, um, and that drug has shown a lot of efficacy in breast cancer and is now being looked at in for lung cancer patients, both, both on its own and in combination with the therapy. Um, the other broad bucket of clinical trials I would keep an eye on are the cellular therapy trials, and these are 
a different class of therapy to the PD-1 blockers in that it's not a it's not really a drug you sit in a, an infusion and it can get as an infusion. The cellular therapies are looking at either harvesting so immune cells from your tumor and boosting them outside your body, giving them back to you to, to boost the immune response, or in some cases modifying them outside your body. Um, a process called chimeric antigen receptor or CAR-P. And those are also being looked at for, for lung cancer, a whole lot of other malignancies. Um, and they're at an earlier stage in development than a lot of the other uh, therapies like the ADCs I mentioned, but they're looking promising. They've, uh, they've really shown their most promise in things like leukemia, we're finally starting to see in clinical trials for lung cancer. And I think that's another area to keep an eye on. That is excellent. Like with me, I know in my case, when the immunotherapy was introduced to me, I was already in the hospital. It was in clinical trials and it was the option, the only option for my cancer. If I'm a patient going through cancer, as our next question is asking, the question is asking, how can I find a clinical trial? How would they be able to look for the clinical trials and where would be the best resource for them to look for these clinical trials within their area or, or even somewhere outside of the area? Uh, can you hear me? Um, sorry. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Um, I, <laughs> I can only hear you there when you speak. I was hearing feedback from outside from a, from a different room, I think. Um, okay, no problem. Somebody. I'll be glad to ask the question again. I had stated that in my case, I was in the hospital when immunotherapy was introduced to me. So I was fortunate to be at a location to where they had the clinical trials going on. Outside of my situation, where can someone go to find clinical trials for lung cancer, either in their area, or how can they look outside their area to find those specific clinical trials? Exactly. I think that's a great question, Oswald. I think, um, so, so in the U.S., um, there are what are called cooperative groups, so of oncologists um, across the U.S. Um, many of these are led by, by academic centers at like large. Uh, university hospitals. But if you don't live near one of those large university hospitals, uh, there are often community cancer centers who run these trials as well. And in most parts of the US, um, there are community cancer centers available who run clinical trials for lung cancer. It's just sometimes, say you have, you're in a small town and you have five oncology offices or three oncology offices, it may be trying to work out which one of those are most linked to clinical networks. There's also the option of, of having a consult with an oncologist, a lung cancer doctor at a major center, and then bringing that information home to your own oncologist. And that's something I would often recommend to patients. If you live a good distance from the academic center, it may be worth while contacting them and maybe with them at least to get a plan in place, you know? Um, so I just want to make sure I can hear you uh, when you speak. Cause I, I think what's happening is when I stop speaking, the a different feed comes in for some reason. Okay, we're going to try to work through that. Now, yeah, I remember I when you. I had my immuno... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. I remember I was fortunate enough going through my immunotherapy that I had very little side effects. Many people who go through cancers feel that side effects let you know the cancer is working. Our next question asks, does side effects mean that the immunotherapy is working? Um, so it's not, <laughs> again, it's, it's, it's not a, a kind of linear relationship, but um, there are some data to suggest that patients who have more side effects from immunotherapy may be a little bit more likely to, to have a tumor response to the treatment. But what I would say is I have a lot of patients who have had almost no side effects from immunotherapy and have had a significant tumor response. So it's a much less strong association than, say, the pd one marker I was talking about. So if I were a patient, I wouldn't be too worried if I didn't have side effects. Um, in fact, I'd probably be happy. Um, I think uh, the, ra the rate of side effects with immunotherapy in general is lower than with, say, chemo, for example. And I, I really don't factor it into when I'm 
seeing patients as having their therapy, I don't really factor too much in the side effects in terms of how healthy they are to do well or do or not do well, you know? Exactly. My experience was, was really, I don't want to say great, but I had little to no side effects. I was able to start going back to the gym. I went back to work shortly after. So in my experience, I had very little side effects, which really made immunotherapy the best treatment for me. We're going to move on to a live question that we have from Lenny. Now, Lenny is on Keytruda, and Lenny asks that he, he says that he was diagnosed in 2019 with stage four non-small cell cancer. He is on immunotherapy combination as maintenance. His last scan showed no evidence of disease. How long can or should Lenny stay on Keytruda? Thank you for your question, Lenny. Yeah, that's a great question, Lenny, and it's one it's one we um, we struggle with. You know, I think, um, but it's a good struggle in some ways to have. You know, because it's it's showing the treatment is working. Um, so the clinical trials of these drugs. Um, they generally continued them on to two years of therapy. Um, and my uh, my personal approach is generally to continue, for example, Keytruda for two years. But I, uh, when you get out to that 18-month period or, or even in the second year of therapy, I have a relatively low threshold for, for stopping the treatment if there's a, a toxicity or for, a, for taking a treatment break, you know. Um, the other thing, Keep in mind is that um, Keytruda is now available to be given once every six weeks, um, whereas previously it had to be given every three weeks. And that is an option as well for patients, which may allow them to live a more normal life and not be tied to the oncology office. But at two years, if there isn't any evidence of active tumor on the scan, I generally favor for many patients um, holding it at that point if they're comfortable with that decision as well, you know. And there is the option in the future to retreat if the cancer were to grow back. Excellent. So we're going to jump down to another live question. And this live question comes from Pat. Pat says, my mom is 82 years old and has stage three non-small cell cancer and is not eligible for standard treatment. She wants immunotherapy, but they say Medicare won't pay for it until stage four. Pat would like to know, would a clinical trial allow her to receive this treatment? Um, well, I think that's a difficult one. You know, um, so everything is kind of different subtleties there. Um, but stage three lung cancer, where you're not suitable for radical treatment, um, that can often be, can fit into the same bucket as stage four lung cancer, you know. Um, so that's something I would probably discuss further with her oncologist. Um, the other possibility is whether she's, physically fit for, for treatment in general, and that's a broader discussion. But I wouldn't, in a patient who, for whatever reason, is not suitable for surgery or is not suitable for what we look and normally do for stage three is definitive chemo radiation, so, so radiation for six weeks. In that situation, many people would fit that patient into the same bucket as stage four lung cancer. And in that case, often um, discussing with the patient's insurance or indeed submitting that information for Medicare approval can often lead to a change in that decision, you know. So that's something I would explore further with the oncologist, you know, and if necessary, if feasible to seek a second opinion from uh, uh, from lung cancer specialist close to you, you know. Exactly. I do recall that me, when I, when I arrived in the hospital, I was at stage four already. My cancer was very, very advanced. So they were able to give it to me because I was at that level. But I do also remember there was a little back and forth with some of the insurance companies because it was so new. We're going to jump into our yeah, next live yeah. question, which comes from Sheldon. Sheldon wants to know, how does precision medicine inform the application of immunotherapy to various patients? Yeah, so I think it's becoming more and more important. You know, we're um, uh, so there's this um, uh, testing we call next generation sequencing or mutation testing, and we do a lot of for for non squamous or for uh, lung adenocarcinoma, which is the most common type of non small cell lung cancer. Um, it has become standard to do this next generation sequencing test. Um, and that's essentially looking for mutations in the tumor cells which are not present in your old normal cells. Um, 
And that can help guide, especially this form of treatment, um, pill treatments for specific mutations if they're present in the tumor. And that has a particular interplay then with how we use immunotherapy, because for example, if we find one of those mutations present in the tumor, and these are things like EGF4, uh, the ALK gene I mentioned, um, ROS1, so there's a whole host of them now. Uh, the, uh, that can sometimes mean that, uh, that the first uh, best treatment is a targeted therapy, but it doesn't rule out the use of immunotherapy later. There are also some of those mutations can, can give some hint that perhaps immunotherapy wouldn't be the best first choice. Um, so it's a complex area and it's rapidly developing, um, but I think it's a very exciting area because it helps us be a little bit more precise, as the name suggests, in terms of our recommendations. Excellent. We have time for one, maybe two more questions, but I think that this next question is very, 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 very important. Our next live question asks, are there any major cancer centers that will consult remotely for immunotherapy? In the case of this question, in the case of this person, their mom is older and finds it very difficult to travel. So if you're finding it hard to travel, are there any major cancer centers that will consult, that will consult remotely? Yeah, it's a, so, so it's a difficult one at the moment in that we were actually doing a lot of telemedicine during the COVID pandemic, but those rules, unfortunately, have changed back in the last couple of months. Uh, many of the states have changed their, their licensure rules, uh, making it more difficult to do telemedicine. However, I would say that many of the major centers, including Johns Hopkins, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, I know the University of Colorado out west, they do have a remote program. Um, and it's uh, publicized on many of their websites. Um, so what I would suggest is, is uh, so for example, for Colorado, if you put in lung cancer in Colorado and remote into Google, it'll likely come up. Um, and they now, uh, one of the other questions is about the insurance coverage of that. And, and that's something also to, to clarify with those programs when you contact them, whether it's a personal cost to you or a cost to your insurance company. But I would encourage if it's if it's possible, and I think as a community, we need to, to advocate for more telemedicine if we can do it, you know. Exactly. Now, this question, I, I believe, is very relevant because we don't know how things react. The, the, the patient is asking, are patients who are very young versus very old treated differently for lung cancer? And I would like to add, does immunotherapy work better in older or younger, or is it, or is age even a consideration when considering immunotherapy? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like the toxicity in that there have been a small few studies suggesting perhaps that uh, the older patients don't derive quite as much benefit, but it's a very a loose relationship. And I, again, I would not rule out immunotherapy for any patient based on age. What we look at really when we see a new patient coming into the clinic is what we call performance status, and that's really how, how active that patient can be or is day to day. Um, are they sleeping more than 50% of the day, for example? Are they up and about? Are they able to look after themselves? Because that performance status, more so than age, predicts how much side effects they'll have from the treatment and how beneficial that treatment will be. Um, so age is definitely not a barrier. Um, and we have 90 year olds who are who are very active and we have 30 year olds who unfortunately are not so active. So it can, it, 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 so it's more of what we call this performance status rather than age. But I think it's, it's a good question and it's relevant. And I think again, seeking opinion from, from the oncologist and having a comprehensive assessment is important. That is excellent advice. Dr. Ford, I would like to thank you on the behalf of Cancer Research Institute for taking the time to be with us today. Just to let guys, just let you guys know, if you submitted a question and it was not answered or would like to continue submitting questions, you can do that. And the questions would, will be gone over and answered by a panel of qualified doctors and medical professionals. Once again, Dr. Ford, we thank you very much for taking, taking your time to be with us today. Once again, we'd also like to thank all of you joining us here at Cancer Research Institute Summit. On behalf of Cancer Research Institute and all of us involved, we thank you all for being here and wish you all the best. I'm Oswald Peterson. Thank you very much and have a great day.